Hey everyone, Rose here, and it's time for the materials. I sculpted, retopologized, and rigged this character in previous videos. If you haven't seen them, definitely go check them out. So the only thing left to do now is the materials. Like the previous videos in this series, I'm gonna be talking about my general thought process while the time-lapse runs in the background. So I hope you guys can get something out of it, and on with the time-lapse. Of course, before I can add any texturing or baking to this character, he's gonna need some UVs, so that's what I do first. Just like with retopology, while UV unwrapping, there are a couple of different things you kind of need to balance to make sure everything turns out right. On the one hand, you want to avoid having your UV map super squashed and stretched in places because that can mess with how the texture looks. But on the other hand, you want to avoid having too many seams, especially seams in very visible places, because seams tend to be the kind of place where you get some slight shading problems, especially if you're using a normal map, or you just get a slightly visible seam on your final model, and that doesn't tend to look very good. My personal workflow is generally to try and split up the model into sensible sections so that, for example, the arms, the legs, the head all get their own UV island. And once I've done that, I go around and use a grid texture to see where I'm getting any really bad stretching and add in extra seams there just to reduce the stretching to a sort of reasonable amount. There are situations where I can't avoid having seams in really visible places. For example, with furry characters, I tend to have a seam down the center of the face. And that's just because he, for example, has a really long nose, so there's no way I can take his long face and put that on a flat texture without getting really bad stretching on the sides. Human beings have relatively flat faces, so you can get away with not having a seam on the face, but with furry characters, I haven't found a way to make that work. Once I'm happy with the UV unwrapping itself and I'm happy with all my seams are placed, it's time to pack my UV map. That essentially means arranging all the islands in a way that they take up as much as possible of the texture and don't leave a bunch of wasted free space. There are add-ons you can use to do that really quickly and efficiently, for example, UV Pack Master, or there's also, I think, a free add-on called UV Packer. In this case, I do it manually just because I want to arrange things in certain ways and just have particular parts of the UV map in certain positions. You don't really need that in the vast majority of cases, it's just for my own sort of process. And because that's how I did it with the previous models in this series, I just wanted to say consistent with those. There's probably some other fancy stuff you can do with UV maps to make them work a bit better for specific things, but I tend to just stick to the basics, and so far that's pretty much worked. Anyway, with the UV map done, it's time to head to baking. While Blender has baking tools for most of my recent models, you'll have noticed that I've been baking in Xnormal instead. And that's mostly just because I've run into a bunch of issues when trying to bake normal maps in Blender. Sometimes it works perfectly fine and I get a perfectly functional normal map out of it and I can use it and everything is good. But sometimes I just end up with some random issues. For example, there tend to be some glitches in the normal map in tight spots, especially things like the corner of the mouth or in between the fingers where I have sort of two surfaces from the model relatively close together and Blender just struggles to figure out which side I'm trying to bake and it just ends up with these weird red and green glitchy spots all along the model and Xnormal has an option to just turn off back face hits and that pretty much prevents them from showing up. And then occasionally I just have completely random issues where, for example, I end up with weird seams on different parts of my model and I don't know why and Xnormal has just been relatively consistent. I haven't ended up with any random bugs. The only bugs I have had were stuff that I could relatively easily fix by just adjusting the ray distance a bit. For baking stuff like ambient occlusion, I haven't really had any issues in Blender. That tends to turn out fine. 
but since I'm baking an extra normal anyway, I might as well just do both there so I don't have to start two different rounds of baking in two different pieces of software. So yeah, X-Normal has been really good for baking, despite the software itself looking a bit old and janky. I haven't run into any issues with it, which is nice, especially since it's also free. I've also heard that Marmoset Toolbag is really good for baking, but I haven't tried that out yet because it's not exactly cheap. And I really haven't needed to since X-Normal has been working fine for me. So now the only thing left to do is paint the base color in Blender. The ambient occlusion is very nice because it adds that bit of extra depth so I don't have to worry about that while painting. I just have to do the very basic flat colors that I can usually also just color pick off the reference that I have anyway. Blender's texture painting tools are pretty alright. That being said, there are a couple of things that always just bug me a lot every time I use them. Especially when comparing them to, say, the Sculpt Mode Vertex Paints in the Alpha versions of Blender, or the Poly Paint tools in ZBrush. And the main issue I have is just the way the projection painting is set up. Whatever you're doing, your brush doesn't wrap around the model at all. So, for example here, if I'm looking at the model from the front and paint an area grey, even with a very large brush size, if I then turn the model to the side, the grey is just gonna have a harsh line where it ends and the rest and the back of the model is still gonna be the color it was before. And compared to, again, the vertex paints or how ZBrush works, is if I'm zoomed out and using a large brush and I paint just all over the front of the model, it's just gonna wrap around and paint the back too. Or if I'm zoomed further in, it's just not going to paint around the back as well. And even when there it does occlude, it's not going to just end with a harsh line. It tapers off sort of softly as if the brush existed in 3D space and you just stop painting at the sides. Like it feels a lot more natural and sensible and a lot less annoying. There were some other things that also annoyed me a little bit, but they aren't quite as bad. For one thing, Blender's brushes don't have anti-aliasing for some reason. So like if I'm using a round brush that has relatively hard edges and paint with it, you can just genuinely see the pixel outline of the circular brush, like with nothing to smooth that out. Most other painting software have some kind of anti-aliasing on their brushes and just Blender doesn't for some reason. But that's not a huge issue because most of the time I'm painting with a soft brush anyway. And then speaking of soft brushes, there isn't really an easy way to blend in Blender. Which is kind of ironic also. You can't blend well in Blender. Um, there is a smudge brush, which is quite slow. And it also smudges, it doesn't really blend. And then there is a blur brush, which blurs. But it does so in a relatively small area and not very strongly. So if I have, say, a gradient... Um, in the pattern of the character, like here, he has this dark grey that should sort of blend into the lighter grey. I have to very slowly use the opacity of my brush to carefully blend it together. I don't really have any sort of blending brush that would make it easier. But again, with a bit of manual work, I can get that to work so it's not super terrible. A while ago I actually tried out Substance Painter in the hopes that it would be better for my kind of workflow with texture painting, but I was quite disappointed. It had a lot of the same issues, especially the problem with projection painting, and it had some additional issues, specifically the fact that I can't hide parts of, of the mesh, but that's around for another day. So yeah, that wasn't much of a help. In the future, at some point, I want to try out 3D Coat. I've heard good things about that when it comes to texture painting. So, if I do end up trying that out, we'll see if it's any good. For now, the last thing I do is bake the ambient occlusion down onto the flat textures, so that I only have one texture map. And with that, the materials, and by extension, the entire character, is done. And here's the finished model. I'm quite happy with how he turned out, and the commissioner is happy with him too. 
and I hope you guys have enjoyed the process and this slightly different style of videos that I did for this series. I didn't really narrate the process as much for this one, I just talked more about some general ideas and thoughts I have throughout the process. So I hope it was interesting and insightful to you and it maybe helped you out for your own projects in the future. And that's been all for me for this video. If you've enjoyed it, feel free to leave a like and subscribe and all that, and maybe check out some of the other videos on the channel. I also have some of my other social medias linked in the description below, so if you want to see some of the art that I don't end up posting on YouTube, definitely go check those out. There is also a Discord server linked down there, so if you want to hang out and chat or maybe share some of your own art or ask some art-related questions, definitely join that, there's a whole bunch of very nice fun people. Anyway, with all that self-promotion out of the way, I hope you guys have a lovely week and see you all next time.